How y'all doing? Miss mm -hmm. Rhodes, Miss Graves, how are you? Good. Good. I'm good. How are you? All right. How are you? Good. Mr. Williams, how are you, sir? Mr. Williams, can you hear me, sir? Mr. Williams, can you hear me? Are you talking to me? Yes. Oh, <clears throat> excuse me. Hi, I'm well. How are y'all? <laughs> so it's it's uh, Mr. Williams, correct, or Mr. Victor? Uh, yeah, it's Williams Arana. Okay, Williams Arana. All right, Mr. Williams Arana, how are you, sir? I'm doing pretty well and I'm glad to be here. I'm glad you're here. All right, give me a second, guys. We're just gonna wait a few more minutes, give uh, enough time for everyone to come on in. I usually at the beginning of my classes, in Zoom, I usually have music playing. So this is kind of unusual. I have a question. Yes. Um, so I was able to enroll yesterday, but mm -hmm. um, so I got the email late mm -hmm. and I wasn't able to get in Canvas until like just not too long ago because I wasn't sure like how to get on. And then at first it wasn't like letting me, but I got on and I seen the um, quiz that we were supposed to take and it ends today. Like, is that okay? I can still like take it. Yeah. Okay. I didn't know. I just like seen it today. And Are you sure that it ends today or is it just due today? I believe it's just due today. Or, okay, yeah, do today. I just want okay. to make sure. All right. Because I just, like, was able to get onto Canvas. Okay. The reason why I asked that, because there's still some quirks in uh, Canvas. It seems like uh, our CTI department doesn't know how to use it yet. I said that out loud. Yes, I did. But, uh, so I, I had to make sure, Miss Graves. But I'm glad you made it. I'm glad you made it. I was concerned that you weren't going to make it on time. Yeah, I like got my email. I couldn't work my email yesterday either, so I wasn't sure if I was going to make it either. <laughs> so everything was failing on you, essentially. Yeah. Oh, that's not good. It's not good. I went on campus today, and I was hoping to start this class on campus. And... Guess what's not working on campus right now? The internet? Yes. <laughs> yeah, the internet is down, which is something that we're all familiar with. All right, let's begin. Everyone else is gonna to have to catch up. Um, there are some of you who already know me and uh, some of you don't. I'm Instructor Elix, uh, US government for uh, uh, Langston University for the summer term. And it's nice to meet all of you. I'm glad you're here. Um, Mr. Uh, Williams, uh, is this uh, your uh, first year college or are you an uh, uh, upperclassman um, or are you starting in the fall, which, which is happening? Yes, sir. I'm an incoming junior. I just spent my sophomore year at Langston and uh, I'll be a junior this fall. 
Okay. Well, now, usually this is this class is reserved for freshmen and sophomores. Uh, uh, why are you taking it so late? I'm taking it this at this time because I didn't I didn't take it this past fall or spring, and I had transferred from a different university. Ah, okay, okay. Well, I'm glad you're here. Where'd you come from? I came from New. Okay. Did your, I think your internet just pause or is that me? Okay, you kind of went out there a second ago. Could you repeat that? What school are you, you're coming from right now? Yes, sir. I came from Newman University in Wichita, Kansas. Hmm. Very nice, very nice. What made you uh, choose us? Um, my grandparents and uh, my great uncles and aunts had all come to Langston and a lot of my and a lot of their children went to Langston as well. And I wanted the HBCU experience. All right. Well, you're coming back at the right time. Uh, it seems like COVID is ending. We'll know for sure within the next two weeks. And if it's pretty much ending, we are hopeful that you get the full college experience here at, at HBCU. So welcome. Welcome. Miss Rhodes, how are you, ma'am? Good. I'm glad to see you. I'm glad to see you. And I'm very proud of you. And we'll leave it at that. Okay. Thank you. Mr. Bowen, the same to you, sir. I'm glad to see you, sir. And I'm proud of you, sir. I'm glad to be here. <laughs> Mr. Bowen, you may be, but the voice don't sound like you are, man. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. I was, I'm, uh, Filling some papers out, so my mind is kind of on two different things. I hope no one's got you stressed, man. I hope everything's. I hope everything works okay, Mr. Benson. How are you today, sir? I'm good. How you doing? All right, man. Where are you right now? I'm at home. Where's home? Also. Oh, okay. I'm glad you're here too, sir. I'm proud of you. All right. Ms. Graves, how are you? I'm good. I'm glad you're able to walk in and everything, see this new Canvas system that we have. Thank the Lord we went to Canvas. Oh, God. But uh, I just want to say I'm proud of you. I'm glad you're here. Ms. Gonzalez. Welcome. Hi. Hi. <laughs> you are you okay? Yeah. <laughs> well, I'm glad you're here and I'm proud of you too. Thank you. Miss Brinkley, how are you? Hi. I'm good. Hi. Ah, good. Is this your first semester with us at Langston? Um, I just completed the spring semester. Ah, okay. And how was that for you? Uh, it was not what I expected. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, because I didn't go to high school. So mm -hmm. it was like this just big old jump from nothing to something. <laughs> it was, yeah, it was tough. Oh, that's okay. That's okay. You'll get adjusted and uh, you're, you're going to do well. So I'm not too worried about you, but remember, no matter what, and this is something that a lot of people don't do, come to us. If something doesn't, if you don't understand something, something's confusing, come to us, come to us. We'll help you out. We'll get you going, okay? okay. And welcome. Thank you. Welcome. Ms. Bonson, how are you? I'm good. All right. Now, Bonton, are you from Louisiana? Uh, no, my family is. <laughs> <laughs> the reason I, I know that name down there, we, we lived down there for a while, so I got to know the names, and that name seems very familiar down there. So yeah. is this your first year as well? No, I'm currently, um, after this, I'll be a junior. All right. Congratulations. Congratulations. I'm glad you've been here for a while. And I'm glad you joined us this summer. Ms. Williams, how are you today? Hey, Mr. Elix, I'm doing fine. 
All right. I'm glad you're here. <laughs> I'm glad I'm here too. <laughs> hey, I'm proud of the I'm proud of you that you're here, okay? And that you guys are all here for this summer course. Now, here are the little ground rules. This class really is supposed to meet on Mondays and Wednesdays via Zoom or in person. Well, this is what's happening on campus. Most of the lecture halls are locked on campus. They basically shut campus down. And most of you guys have already gone home. So we're doing all this over Zoom, which is a good thing. But to make it even more convenient for you, uh, we are just going to meet here every Wednesday from 1 to 3. You're great. <laughs> You're great, Professor. You're great. <laughs> because, look, not only I have a lot of stuff to do, but we know you guys have a lot of stuff to do. A lot of y'all are holding down jobs so you can make money before this next semester. And I know this class is important. You may be taking one or two classes. And especially since I started here at Langston in the fall, I have been retooling, retooling this class to make it even more proficient than it was. Because in order for you to move to your upper level courses, there are some things that you need to know. You need to be able to uh, critically think. You need to be able to write and be able to express yourself in writing. When you are writing, you need to provide evidence. You need to be able to argue a point. And I'm incorporating in this more and more and more as we go along. And I've done different versions of this and some of you have already experienced that, but this one is gonna to be totally different where everything else is all emerged. Uh, my lectures are gonna be more to that point, but what I, my philosophy on reason for this class will still be expressed and when you leave, I want to make sure that you are well-informed voters. So with, well, we got a few more coming up. So we're going to wait until Miss Hunter pops in here and we're going to say hi to her. Miss Hunter, how are you? Good. How are you? All right. Is this your first semester? No, sir. All right. What's your classification? Are you junior, sophomore, freshman? Freshman, come, upcoming sophomore. All right. So uh, why'd you decide to take the U.S. government at this time? Um, I just had to redo the class because I didn't do as well as I wanted to the mm -hmm. first time. So I just want to do a better job. Now, I don't, did you take that? Did you take the, I don't think you took the course with me. Who did you take it with? Yeah, in fall. Really? In the fall? Yes, sir. Oh, <laughs> oh, oh see that. That's an example of being 50. Because I thought I had everybody's name remember. I, I'm sorry, Ms. Hunter. Please forgive me for that. You're all good. <laughs> but I'm glad you're here. I'm glad you're here. So I'm going to give you a choice. Um, the, basic, uh, the basic function of our republic is that the people make the choice. They vote people in to make the decisions for them. And here I'm going to give you a democratic choice where you can choose how we're going to go. Now, I have a certain set of things I want to cover today. And I just want to cover the nuts and bolts of how this class is going to work. And I have a full lecture over chapter one. But chapter one is something that is very easy to read, very easy to follow in uh in the book and the quiz is not too bad. So the question is this, something you can vote on. Would you like for me to just go over the nuts and bolts and leave chapter one to you? Or go over the nuts and bolts and go over chapter one. And I wanna tell you chapter one will have only one question on the final exam and that's it. You can leave it to us. 
What was that, yeah, Mr. Can definitely, yeah, definitely. Yeah, leave, leave it for us. Leave it yeah, that's part. <laughs> that is a okay. Okay. All right, Mr. Williams Arana, what do you think, sir? I would prefer you to go over chapter one. Okay. Well, this is what I'll do. Since so many people uh, want to uh, want want to leave it to us, I'll go over the nuts and bolts. And for anyone who wants to stay after that. I'll go over chapter one. Okay. How's that? Yes, sir. Good. All right. All right. So let's go over the nuts and bolts. Um, we've already done um, myself and I already introduced myself. Uh, you've seen my welcome video, which is the most jinkiest thing I've ever done in my life. So please forgive me for that. But as many of you know, that last year was my first year here at Langston. Um, I have been doing this as a political science professor for the last four years. Uh, I received my bachelor's and master's degree from Oklahoma City University, currently receiving my PhD in public policy and economic policy at Liberty University. Uh, I have had um, several certificates in history as well as in economics. So when I go over it, uh, our, our US government, I'm doing it from that point of view and how people, when they participate in our government, how those things affect them. So I'd like to bring that to you. Uh, before then, I worked in the private sector uh, the last major position I had was a subject matter expert for AT&T, in which we did a lot of government and military contracts for what I did. Uh, you may search for me out there and you may see some things that may say even customer service for AT&T, but that's what should be out there. So that's, that's fine. But uh, other than that, the reason why I do this, my passion for this really is that I feel that the marginalized people in this country are marginalized for one specific reason. They don't use the power that is given to them to vote in mass together. And a lot of you, come from the ideology or things that you've learned from your parents and learn from friends around you. And of course, you know about this, some of you, when we go to uh, chapter 10, chapter 11, when we're talking about political ideology, is that voting is for suckers. Voting doesn't count. It's a rigged system. And I hate to tell you, the only person or only thing that is rigged is you. Because if voting didn't count, if voting didn't matter, why do so many people in power try so hard to limit the vote? Why? Because it matters. Those who vote win. Those who don't vote lose. And among minorities here, and even poor whites, these are the communities that don't vote as often. And you can see the lack of power that they have. But when, and as we have demonstrated, or life has demonstrated within the past year, when you vote together in mass, not only on the national level, but on local levels, you have power but you have to consistently vote. And as we go through different aspects of American government, I'm gonna emphasize that a little bit more. So that is my passion. That's why I do it. I want to see marginalized people who have finally gained their voice within the last 50 years, who are equally speaking out in this great marketplace of our country to actually put those words instead of always going to the streets 
put those words to action by going to the ballot boxes. And that is mostly where the failure happens. Everybody will go in the street, they will complain, they, were, they would demonstrate and everything else. But in April or June or August or November, no one votes or only a small number vote. And that's when the failure comes in. And that's why people don't listen to us. And that's why the same old thing keeps going going. So that's why I do this. Now, some of you have heard this maybe in different ways, but all in all, it's the same. I want to make sure that you know that your vote counts. And if you don't use it, someone will use you as a tool. And that's a fact. All right, so let's move forward. Now, the next thing I wanna go over is our syllabus. Now, this is the most boring part of this, which you guys pretty much expect at it. So I'm gonna to try to limit this to just only a few moments. So let me share my screen here. And let me know if you see it. All right, does everybody see this? Yes, I see it, sir. Yes, yes, I see it, sir. I see it. All right, thank you. All right, of course, my syllabus has to be the best looking because that's just how I am. I, I, I gotta have the best. I gotta, I gotta have it nice, clean, crisp for you. Read this. This helps you so much. I know reading the syllabus is the most boring brain draining, gray matter coming out of your ear kind of thing. But it has a lot of resources and it tells you how this class is gonna go. A lot of people get trapped in the semester because they don't know where things are or who to go to. And the only thing you have to do is two things. Number one, look through your syllabus. And if it's not clear, number two, ask your professor. So as we go through this here, you can find things, not too many have a table of contents. I always have that table of contents, helps you find everything you need. And then we come to here. Here's the time in which you can always contact me, Monday through Thursday from 9 a.m. to 12 p.m. No matter what, I will be available to you. I can even be available to you via Zoom, but you must make an appointment. So since this is on, uh, since this is a PDF, you can always click right here on the link, make an appointment and I'll be right there and we can talk together, okay? But Monday through Thursday from 9 a.m. to 12 p.m. Required textbook. It's the O'Connor, Karen, Sabo, or you have the ebook option by going into Pearson. So if you look, in Canvas, you will see something that says Pearson on your left-hand side in the menu. Just click it, it will take you out to Pearson. If you have not created an account with Pearson, create account through Pearson by going that route. Use your Langston EDU email address. And everything for this class, the book quizzes that I have in Pearson will pop up. But if you have a full-size book, a regular book, it should look like this, if you can see that. So definitely make sure you have, you make sure you again, have this. Mr. Oh, sure, oh, sure. There you go. There you go. Thank you. No problem. All right, required equipment. This course requires that you have a desktop or a laptop computer with Microsoft Windows, Apple OS, or Google OS software installed with the current software update. You cannot properly access or complete the assignments in this class on a mobile phone or tablet. If you do not have this equipment, please contact your advisor for assistance or withdraw from this course. 
a lot of students get caught with this because they only have their phone. And that happened a lot last year. They're just using their phone or a tablet. What you have to understand is that laptops and desktops and any mobile device like a phone or tablet use two different types of server systems where this mobile server allows you to only see certain things and so it can fit on your mobile device where the laptop or desktop gives you the full view and access. So a lot of people got hung up that way because they're only using their phone or they're using a tablet. If you don't have a desktop or a laptop computer for this course by next week when things get, we start really getting into a lot of things, drop because you need that. Or contact Ms. Buckley on campus, Cynthia Buckley, and she will show you how to get a free laptop, okay? All right, required materials. If we were in class, but even though we're not, please bring a pen or notebook paper or a laptop computer. Use these items to take notes. Now, I'm only gonna go over the highlighted areas. I need you to go over the regular areas. It's more in detail, but I want you to be, be able to understand what we're about to go through. Your coursework, there will be a total of 1,000 points possible in the class. And these points will be captured using a variety of methods. All assignments, except for pop quizzes and exams, yes, there will be pop quizzes, are due Thursday at 11.59 p.m. After it has been assigned, if an assignment is completed after the due date, it is considered late and will receive a late penalty of 30%. If the assignment is not completed by Saturday at 11.59 p.m., the assignment will close and the uncompleted assignment will receive a zero grade. Once an assignment has been closed, it will not be reopened unless the reason complies with the Langston University attendance policy listed below in this syllabus. Does anybody have any questions about that? Everybody good? All right, your silence also speaks. All right, general assignments. There will be several types of quizzes and assignments in this class. A syllabus quiz, which all of you have to complete, and I want you to pass with a C, okay? Complete your syllabus quiz and pass with a C. And that's to verify that you read this syllabus. Well, part of that you'll understand by the fact we're going over it. Pop quizzes to make sure that you're maintaining your reading of the text and other materials. Schedule concept quizzes to assess your understanding of cover concepts. Essay quizzes to assess your ability to comprehend and to explain the concepts you're learning in class. And general assignments to apply your knowledge of the concepts to a real world scenario. So, there will be different things that will pop up. And of course, they will mostly, pop quizzes will happen on the Wednesdays that we meet. So be ready, be prepared when we meet every Wednesday. But during the week, if there's some, if there's gonna be a quiz, I will have it assigned to you that Sunday before. And you will be able to see it and you'll be able to get in there and you'll be able to work, okay? Exams, this course will have two exams, a midterm exam and a final exam. The context for these exams will be drawn from the PowerPoints provided by the instructor, notes, readings, and supplemental material. Exams will consist of a mixture of multiple choice, fill in the blank, and essay. Now, some of you who had been in my class before, we did separate essay questions, period. We're not gonna do that anymore. What we're gonna do is we may have one of the quizzes of the week may be an essay, or some of the quizzes of the week may have a combination of multiple choice or essay, but the exam will be half the points come from multiple choice, the other half will come from essay. This will test your ability to, uh, of your knowledge of the materials that we went over, 
but it also will test your ability on critical thinking, being able to weigh both arguments and to explain or to argue a point and to support that point with evidence. I will give you enough materials that you can use on the exam so you can answer those essay questions. I'm not just gonna throw that out to you and God help you, you survive. I will give you plenty of time for the exams. I plan to give you 90 minutes. Now, most, some of you know that's a change. I usually only get about 60 minutes. Now I'll give you a full hour and a half to finish your exams. So here are the exam dates. So get this down guys. The midterm exam will be between the 27th through the 29th of June. That's the midterm exam. It will open on that Sunday, the 27th, and will close on the 29th. You will have that time to finish it. But once you start your exam, remember, you have to complete it. You will have 90 minutes to complete it. The final will be between the 21st of July through the 23rd of July. 21st is a Sunday, all the way to the 23rd. No, actually 21st is a Wednesday, sorry about that. All the way to the last day of this semester, which is the 23rd. So you'll have that time to complete your exam. Any questions on those dates? Everybody good? All right. Participation and attendance. Participation in class discussion is highly important for everyone throughout the week. Without participation, the learning of the concepts in this class will be difficult to grasp. Participation will be noted each week when a student answers questions in class, openly participates in discussion in class without straying from the concept being discussed, ask questions based upon the concepts being covered, and volunteering for an in-class demonstration. Class participation is worth 25 of your overall grade. You must participate at least once per week in a lecture or you will not receive this credit for that week of study. All right, since you guys already answered my questions, you get this grade for week one. Congratulations. That's a free grade. That's a free Thank grade. you. All right, so good job, good job. But this is a change as well from my courses because one of the, one of the things I had hope is that me would prod, poke a little bit to create participation, to create people to get involved. And unfortunately it did not work. So in the future going forward, participation will actually be graded. So if someone is sitting in the back of the class or in Zoom and they decide to wander off, I call your name and you don't answer. And since we meet once a week, I will call your name one more time. And if you don't answer and it's not a technical issue, which I can tell if it is, you don't get participation. So no wandering off. Attendance is required daily as per our standard university attendance policy. I'm gonna be honest about this, guys. I'm gonna be 100% honest. Last time I checked, you are all adults. You in one way or another are paying for this class. I don't want to do this, but I have to. I have to take attendance. I did take attendance simply by just uh, checking to see if you've completed weekly assignments and I'm not doing it. Well, so we meet once a week. My schedule says Monday and Wednesdays. That's correct, Ms. Hunter. I said earlier at the beginning of the class, we are only gonna meet on Wednesdays at one o'clock. What do you think about that? <laughs> Let's see. Sounds good. All right. Thanks, so you, you're, you're in with everybody else, okay? All right, but be here. 
definitely be here. Be here for this class. Since I see no problem. <laughs> be here for this class. And I will have a sign in sheet or I'll just simply see who chimes in. I'm not going to, uh, I'm not going to worry about you being too late. I'll give you enough time to be in, but uh, that usually upon average, if you're here about 10 minutes late, most people count you absent. So get here on time. Get here on time. And if you're not going to be here or it looks like you're going to be past 10 minutes late, send me an email. Let me know why. And just don't show up that day. Yes, you're going to lose 10 minutes for that week. But at least I understand where you are. I'll know that you're OK. OK? But as we continue on, this is something to remember. Students missing seven days of class and or missing seven assignments will receive an AW or administrative withdrawal. So this should be shortened in half for the summer. But because Langston doesn't have a specific attendance policy for the summer, we're going to keep it at seven days or seven assignments. If you miss seven days or seven assignments, I will automatically administrative withdraw you. And you will be notified by an email why. OK? Everybody got that? We all good? All yes. Right. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, we're good. All right. Hey, I'm proud of you guys. You stay in the way. Because I, I ain't gonna lie. I used to fall asleep in this part when I was a student at your age. So you guys are better than me. All right, methods of evaluation. The final grade will be based on a potential total of 1,000 points. These points will be awarded in the following manner. Attendance will be 5% of your grade. Participation, 20% of your grade. So showing up and actually taking part in class is 25% of your grade. That's huge. General assignments and quizzes, 25% of your grade. Exams are 50% of your grade. And of course, the letter grades are distributed according to the point system right here. All right. All right, this is kind of a repeat, but we need to go over it. Assignments are available no later than su each Sunday or Monday morning at 12.01 a.m. If for some reason something comes up and I have not published an assignment, it will be published the next day no later than 12.01 a.m. So that basically, basically what this is, it's given me all day Sunday to make sure I publish an assignment. All assignments are due on Thursday at 11.59 p.m. after they have been assigned. If an assignment is completed after the due date, it is considered late and will receive a late penalty of 30%. If an assignment is not completed by Saturday at 11.59 p.m., the assignment will close and the uncompleted assignment will receive a zero grade. Once an assignment has been closed, it will not be reopened for any reason unless the reason complies with the Langston University attendance policy listed below. Some of you said, Mr. Elick, you already said this. Why must this be said? Well, because there was a lot of confusion on this. Even though I've said that many times in the last fall and last spring semester, even though, and it was at 11.59 p.m. on Saturday night, People were very confused. So to go through this again in the syllabus is like a legal way of making sure that this stipulation is there. This is what I'm going to follow. And this is how everything's going to be administered. Basically, your syllabus is your constitution. And everything has to be based upon that constitution. All right. So let's move forward. 
this is the course outline. This is how it's going to go. We are not going to cover John Locke. Even though this book mentions John Locke, this book mentions Rousseau very briefly, but we're not going to get into deep with that. Also, we're going to go over the foundations of American Republic, which is Declaration of Independence, American Revolution, Articles of Confederation, the ratification of the U.S. Constitution. That's chapter two. The U.S. Constitution is the type of government, federalism, civil liberties, and civil rights. That encompasses chapter three, four, and five. American institutions, chapter six, Congress. Chapter seven and eight, the executive branch and the federal bureaucracy. Chapter nine, the judicial branch. And then of course, that's when our midterm exam is gonna happen. So sections one through four will be on our midterm. Get that, sections one through four will be on our midterm. Sections five and six, which encompasses chapter 10, public opinion, chapter 11, political parties and campaigns, chapter 12, interest groups, chapter 13, the media, chapter 14, economic policy, chapter 15 and 16, social and defense policy. All right, we're getting through, we're getting through, we're almost done, we're almost done, all right. Please go through all of these, I know they're not highlighted, but they apply to everything that's going on to uh, on campus. I don't, the academic calendar is right here, guys. I included that in there so you'll know exactly what's going on in campus. So definitely look through it. And this is the most important part. Express means it's written, or implied means I'm just speaking it, or my actions interpret this is what I'm going to do. Amendment to the syllabus statement is students, there may be express or implied changes to the syllabus as deemed necessary by the instructor at any time during the semester. That means things can change. I will do you the courtesy of letting you know that they've changed. Uh, if for some reason uh, we may cover something in class that I feel is important and it's like a couple of days before the exam, it's not gonna be on the exam. I wouldn't do that to you, even though Sometimes I may feel like I want to do that, but I'm not going to do that to you because I know how it feels to be caught off guard. But if I give you something about two or three weeks before the exam and I really emphasize it, yeah, it'll most likely be on the exam. But things happen in time. None of you ever saw COVID coming. I didn't see it. And we had to change up. That's why this statement is here. So any questions about the syllabus, guys? Nope. All right. Any conflicts? Any conflicts of interest or knowledge or just say, Mr. Elick, I hate it. I don't like it. Throw it away, please. All right. For those of you who have not been in my class before, and I'm going to say this straight up express your opinion. What happens in this class stays in this class. If your ideology or your partisanship is different from mine, that's fine. Because without those ideas being shared here, we learn nothing. Now, the ones who have taken my class before know this that it's cool to do it. But you know that I require that if you're gonna make an opinion, make sure you're informed because I will ask you questions about it and start fleshing it out. 
Some of you have caught me before, and I appreciate that, but I've caught many of you more times than ever. So make sure if you have an opinion on anything, think it out clearly, all right? Anybody has any questions about that? Everybody good? Yeah. Great, guys. All right. So we got over the syllabus. We got over introductions. Everybody knows that we're going to meet every Wednesday at 1 o'clock. What we're going to do on those Wednesdays, we're going to go over the concepts that you viewed through the lecture videos that I've had. So I'm just going to briefly hit them and ask you guys questions to see where you are. And this is where you participate in whatever we, uh, whatever discussion that we have, okay? And to be quite honest, this may be the longest class of this period. But you never know, because as many of you guys have guessed, I love conversations. And I love conversations on topic or on concept. And that just may make our class go long. And that's one of the things I do love about summer classes. When we get into a deep topic, we have time to talk about it. All right. So remember, every Wednesday at 1 o'clock, unless I say, hey, I'm not going to be there that Wednesday. I send you email or I send you an email that has a calendar event that the class has been canceled. So watch your email. Things happen around here. I have to possibly move within the next couple of weeks. So there may be a day that I may not be in class. So you may have a day off, okay? Also, July 5th, we don't have class on Monday at all. I am seriously thinking giving you that Wednesday as the holiday. Um, I haven't decided yet. It just depends on some of the things that may be happening. Might so, as well. <laughs> I, let me think about it. Uh, lectures. Just like your assignment, my recorded lectures will be released at the very earliest at 12.01 a.m. Sunday at the very latest at 12.01 a.m. on a Monday. So you will have the new lectures for the week, no later than Sunday. Uh, assignments, you guys already know the due dates, already told you the exam dates. Uh, midterm exam is between June 27th through the 29th. That's when it's gonna be open. And the final exam will be available between July 21st through the 23rd. And those are the nuts and bolts. Any questions? Victor, you look bored, sir. I'm sorry. I just have a busy house and there's lots of stuff going on. I'm trying to stay focused. It's okay, Victor. Just pick up a book and throw it at him. It's all right. Just say, I'm in government class and throw something at him. We won't tell. Nobody's seen anything. All right. All right, if everybody's good with that, and those of you who want to uh, go out on your own, go ahead and do it. Who wants to listen to me go over a chapter, stay here. But until then, God bless you. Do your best you can. And remember to think critically. Have a great day, Professor. Take care, Thank Mr. You, sir. Have a good day. Take care, Ms. Hunter. Bye. Take care. See you, Ms. Rhodes. Ah, Victor, Amanda, Maya. So you guys want to go over chapter one? Yes. Yes, okay. sir. <laughs> have you read it already? I have. No, Miss Williams. I have not. You have not. Okay. okay. I have not read it yet. Okay. Miss Brinkley, what have you read about this chapter? Mm. It's hard to like explain. Like I just read it, but um, I don't know. Like I would really say, like I just read it. <laughs> <laughs> you just read it. Just went. Like, one exactly. in. Y'all sound, sound like me, girl. I do the same thing. I've been. <laughs> I'm 
I'm like, dang, I'm at the end of the page. What did I just read? No, I was thinking about like going over it again, like seriously, like reading it. Cause I was like, you know, sometimes you like miss stuff and yeah, like I, I read it though. That's why, that's why sometimes look, uh, I have some students that, that tell me and, and let's just be honest about the situation. Reading is not their thing. Let's, let's just be real. I have ADHD. Reading has always been kind of a chore for me. But one of the things I had to learn to do is I have to do what is called active reading. That means I will read a certain thing. And if there's a concept or anything that kind of confuses me, I start taking notes on it. And I either will find more information or ask my professor about it. And that's how I got through it. But the best thing to do is when you're going through this and you see something that is being emphasized, take a note on it. And what will happen is you'll start developing this pattern where you'll start recognizing the most important thing. Now, don't go with the old adage, the bold type is the most important type. No, it's not always that way. And professors are different on what they believe is important. But when it comes to just read, just actively read, if you see something that just seems to very important being emphasized, write it down, write it down and see. So for, okay, sorry, but for me, like, okay, what I did notice, cause I like, I had, you know, um, watched the video that you put out and like basically like what you're trying to accomplish for this class. And for myself being 29, I've never um, voted and I want to vote, but I think that, um, cause I think it's important, but I also think that it's important to note that, you know, you can't just go vote if you're not, you know, knowledgeable. Like if you just voting just because, you know, like <laughs> Trump wanted to put up the wall. I'm like, oh, I like that, you know, but all the other stuff, I don't listen to it, you know? So I never, you know, I just don't want to put my vote in and be on the wrong side or whatever. Mm -hmm. But I did notice like, you know, cause I also have felt like, you know, it don't really matter. And especially, especially if you don't know what you're doing, you know, then it definitely don't matter. But then like how you stated, like, well, why do they make it so hard, you know, for people to vote? And then like, you know, I'm like, you know what, that is true. Like, you know, once a felon, always a felon, you know, and you can't vote. Like, why take that from somebody if it didn't matter? And I noticed like in the um, first chapter, like that this has been something that has been going on from the beginning of time where, you know, it was only white landowners that could mm -hmm. vote. So I did pick right. that up. <laughs> they did stand out, but um, yeah, I don't know. It's okay. It's okay. <laughs> and that means you want to, you want to become an informed voter. There's nothing wrong with that. Actually, that's very smart because you want to know something about what's being voted. And you don't want to just say, oh, I'm just voting because my best friend do. And believe it or not, a lot of people do that. They vote just because their friends told them to, or their friends provide half-assed jinky information. Yes, I said that, Victor. <laughs> half-assed jinky information. And when you really look into it, it is not correct. And that, that is the problem. Listen to this, guys. All of you have heard that the only people who could vote, especially around the time when the Constitution was ratified, was white male landowners, correct? All of you have heard that, right? Correct. And it says this in the book. In reality, women could vote, men could vote, blacks could vote, Chinese could vote. At the time when the Constitution was ratified, and in a lot of the states, they had that right to vote. Most of this was taken away by the 1820s and 30s. And the reason for that is that Blacks, women, and other groups were being used as a power base for other people to uh, uh, gain power that when, like, when to just use a general example, uh, when the Whigs took over or when the Democrats took over during that time, they, by law, changed the law to limit or get rid of Blacks from voting, get rid of women from voting, get women away from people who are foreigners from voting. 
And it's just that nativism. Yeah, it's called nativism. The Americanism kind of attitude started in that time. And it started limiting people to vote. So when we got to around 1840, it was mostly white male landowners. And even that was beginning to pass away to just mostly white males. And that's one of the reasons, of course, eventually we had the Civil War and we go on. But let me go over chapter one right quick and hit the highlights. And let me give you the most boring thing in the world here. Uh, I'm going to give you a PowerPoint. And I don't necessarily like doing it, but it does stress some of the highlights. But I want you to continue to ask questions about anything that you see during this. And this went into the question. And I go past all this. Now, as you know, the book here talks about the earliest inhabitants of Americas, which were the natives. Also talks about the first colonists and a, the religious tradition takes root. Okay, let's talk about that. A lot of the first colonists, uh, colonists were here, not only they were here because of so-called religious prosecution um, in England and in certain lands, but also, um, they were here to make money. America, for most colonists, coming over here was to make money, to do what they can, get enough money, and then go back to their homeland and don't return here. But a lot of people uh, came over like, like uh, the Puritans, like uh, some of the Baptists, some of the uh, other future evangelical groups came over here to establish religious colonies. And also during this period, a lot of people came over during the enlightenment period in which you had people like John Locke, Rousseau was bringing up a new concept where John Locke had his uh, second treaty of government, which talked about how uh, property should be individually owned. Uh, how Rousseau talked about the social contract where you uh, gave a contract, government should buy by a contract of the people that should be designed. And even before uh, John Locke, even before Rousseau, you had, uh, you had uh, Hobbes that came up with the concept of just simply people being beholden by the rule of law separate from natural law, which was God. I know I'm getting into a lot of other stuff, which can be explained more, but just giving you an idea of all the roots of this mess. And yes, I said mess, because if any of these principles were followed, the civil war would have never happened. If any of these principles were followed, the civil rights movement would have never had, the women's rights movement would have never had, uh, uh, the banishment of Asians would have never happened. But these were all concepts that were coming into play and all this religious, all this economic reason, all these ideas just fell into America at one time. And this is obviously not necessarily covered in the book, but it gives you what people like to say color. It gives you an expansion to look at. But also to work on the economic, America was the first place in the world known at that time in which an individual can come over here that claim a piece of land, build a home on it, raise food, crops, livestock, whatever. And if they had surplus, sell it and become wealthy. Now think about that. No time before in history 
where a person can just come anywhere, claim a piece of land, work it, and become wealthy. And a lot of people came from different parts of Europe to do that and then left, but people started to stay more and more because of that concept. And because of the religious reasons and because of the enlightened reasons by Locke, Rousseau, Hobbes, people wanted to stay. So, of course, when they got here, there were indigenous people here. And there were different groups of people here. They had been here over 30,000 years. Actually, to be quite honest, they had been over here over 50,000 years. That number is even wrong. There were over 100 million inhabitants. No one knows for sure, but it's estimated that it's a million, 100 million inhabitants. Europeans brought diseases and warfare, mostly diseases, which wiped them out. They had no immunity to it. But think about the mind of the Europeans that came here. They came over to this land. They see it for an opportunity. They see all these natives and all these natives started to die. In the religious minded of these people, what do you think any of you, they thought by seeing that? Any of you? They thought their arrival had been ordained by God. Exactly. Because God killed their enemies, right? So just because of that, they felt everything that they did in this land or to any native people was blessed by God. And that wasn't the case. Now, I already gave you the, uh, the reasons for immigration. The first permanent settlement was Jamestown. There were other permanent settlements, but they disappeared. So this is a misnomer the first known successful permanent settlement in the colonies here was Jamestown, Virginia. The first slaves, as you know, arrived here in 1619. They were actually came over from a ship in which a merchant just simply exchanged them for goods and services that that merchant want and the only thing they had was slaves and it sold them to a planner who used them. And of course, England was already starting in the slave trade and it just expanded. Now let's expand quickly on that. Slavery had been around for thousands and thousands of years. But what makes slavery so insidious starting at this time is that people made it into an industry. Because usually when you're a slave, before this, you were either captured during battle or you gave yourself as an indentured servant over to a master because you owed a debt, plain and simple. But if you had children, they weren't slaves. Hell, even families eventually freed the slaves and the slave was introduced and brought into the family. But when this time came along during this period, slavery started being a systematic industry where groups of ships went over to Africa, not only white men, but other Africans captured people, kidnapped people, brought them to the coast bound them, put them on ships, and sent them to the Americas, the Caribbean, and India. And what a lot of people don't know, others from India were brought here as slaves as well, and even some Asians. It became an industry, which was first ended in the 1830s by England, 
and of course ended in the United States in 1865 and officially ended by the 13th Amendment. All right, let's go forward. As we said, we talked about Puritans and I'm not gonna go down Roger Williams, Ann Hutchison, Thomas Hooker, William Penn, Pennsylvania. Um, functions of American government. Well, it goes into this and I don't like how this is done. It starts talking about the preamble of the constitution, establish justice, ensure domestic tranquility and providing for the common defense. We're gonna get more into this when we talk in chapter two, because that's when we actually cover the constitution. So this is just a little bit ahead of a time. Um, the changing American people. In this book, it talks about racial and ethnic composition, aging, religious beliefs, regional growth and expansion, and family size. All right, on racial and ethnic composition, it talks about the amount of Asians, uh, Blacks, Hispanics, and other groups in the United States, and of course, the majority group. Everybody, have you heard about 2040? Has any of you heard about 2040? No, I haven't heard of it. Oh, I haven't. What's that? 2040 is the estimated time in which the minorities as a whole will outnumber the whites as a majority. So all the minority groups together in population will outnumber all whites. Except 2040 may not happen because in this last census, we're at 50-50. So it may be more like 2030 or in reality, it may be more like 2025. Because right now the United States because our borders have been closed because of COVID, it has truly been proven, even though we've seen this trend for the last 10 years, that the only thing that was keeping American population growing was immigration. Americans actually have been losing numbers for years. And the last numbers that have come out in the last year that the white population or the European population overall in the United States, those who are descendant from Europeans have lost 10% of their population within the last 10 years. Blacks and Hispanics have grown by 5%. Asians, 2%. Everyone else, about three to 4%. And as more people come in, through immigration, those minority numbers are continuing. But even without immigration, minority numbers are growing. But European American numbers are declining. And because of that, that is beginning, that's going to change the makeup of how people vote. Right now, the majority of people who do vote in this country are European American, white. And as we've seen, when you split that vote and you get most minorities voting one way, you can see where the control of power, which Political science is the study of power and how it's used in a government system sways. Also, our country is aging. It's getting older. And when it gets older, it tends to vote more. People tend to vote more when they get older for several reasons, because one, they have more to lose, and two, they have more time. Religious beliefs are changing. The United States is considered a Christian majority country. Well, the number of people who are proclaiming themselves as Christians have gone down, where Muslims and other religions have come up. But what the growing number is, is people claiming not to be any part of any religion. Regional growth and expansion. The South or what they call the Sun Belt, which encompasses 
uh, the southern United States from the East Coast, all the way through Texas, Oklahoma, Arizona, all the way out to the West, Southern California was called the Sun Belt. And this was a very Christian conservative area which won a lot of elections, especially for Republicans. Well, populations are beginning to change. As we've noticed that with, of course, declining populations, the populations that are beginning to filter in this area are mostly Black and Hispanic and Asian. And people are leaving California mainly because of the high taxes. It's not becoming a factor. But also in the Northeast and in the Northwest, people are moving away more into the center of the country. So the power bases or the changes of power or who's going to determine the number of people who are in Congress or eventually who will win the electoral college and choose a president will be more in the center of country, in the country. Family size and family. Family size because of the lack of population has become smaller. An average family, white family now, once was uh, a husband, a wife, and 2.5 children. Today, the average white family consists of just a mother, single parent home. And if it is two parents, it's only 1.25 children. Average black family now is 2.6. Average Hispanic family is 3.2. Asian family, 2.5, and everybody else runs about two. So with the decreasing size of family or single parent homes, the idea of how people vote, votes are changing. Now, let me propose this question to all of you. If more homes are becoming single, single parent homes, what issues are going to be more important in Washington or in your state capital? Um, depending on like what party each parent is, if it's a single parent home, they're most likely going to vote like how their parent votes because of how the household is ran because it's only like one person's ideas and thoughts that they have that they're growing up on, if that makes sense. That's right. Okay, that's one. How else? I was going to say that people... In single parent homes, we mostly see single parents needing EBT or social security or social welfare. So mm -hmm. they're gonna start voting on those kind of issues. If it's just one parent, they're gonna need more government assistance. Okay. Anybody got any other? There's one more person left. I know, right? They say it at all. Pretty much, um pretty much what they say, or it's just like not voting in itself, you know. Um you know, yeah. your views, like, it's going to most likely push down on your kids. That's correct. I feel like voting, I feel like people view voting as a luxury. Mm -hmm. Like you said, older people are voting more because they have more time, whereas young people don't find that voting is important because we're working as much, we're in school, or we're working, or there's more important things going on in life that don't corroborate or they don't align with voting. Which, right. I, which, is, which is an opinion that I don't agree with. But mm -hmm. I feel like especially young people nowadays, we don't vote because we're like, well, we have to go to school. We have to work. We have to provide for our family. There's quote unquote more important things than the luxury of voting. True, true. Now, this is something you're going to find this shocking, uh, Mr. Williams, is that your generation, millennials and Zs, those two generations right there, your group, as a young group, are the first ones ever to vote massively in the last three elections. Wow. It's the first time it's ever seen in history, especially since uh, the, I believe is the 25th Amendment. No, the, it was the 26th Amendment that allowed for 18 year olds to vote. It's the first time in history that young people continue consistently to vote in mass. And you're right, what you just said actually applied to my generation, which Gen X, 
and to the baby boomers. But it seems like your generation are more con conscious about social justice. Yes. And they seen from or learn, and as, as you two ladies have said as well, the ideology or what they've learned from their parents and the people around them, how government has not done what it has as supposed to do when it comes to marginalized people or just to take care of the country overall or to immigrants or to just provide services. So you guys tend to vote more, but it, to go back to uh, what you said there for, for a moment there, uh, Ms. Brinkley, is that people don't trust government. People don't feel like they should vote. And one of the things of a single parent home, it also creates a lot of alienation, mistrust. And that also takes a lot of voters out and only leaves voting to a specific group. So all of this is in play, but this is actually happening more as in the alienation among the older generation, but among you guys, most of you guys are not in single parent families because you didn't want children. Most of you guys uh, you see the ec you've seen you experienced 2008 that economic truck crash now 2020 and most of your generations have seen not only uh, the things that our government didn't do to help out marginalized people but seen the lack of caring or the lack of action of Congress overall and want to do something about it. That kind of turns this on its head in a way, but it also, it actually proves the point. These changing demographics, how people is changing, how American people are changing overall is just going to make America look totally different. One of the reasons, and I'm going to tell you this, don't worry about what you see right now. What you see right now is normal conflict, normal conflict caused by change. I know when you guys look at news or when you don't look at news, you hear a bunch of crap that just makes you frustrated and just makes you angry. And it's like, why does it happen here in America? What is happening here is this, first time in history that all voices are being heard ever. First time in history where you have young people in mass participating. And now what you're seeing is America changing to what it to finally try to fulfill what the Constitution stands for and to move forward into the future. Because if you look at the world that we live in, most of the world has already transitioned and moved forward. America and how many of us view ourselves, we'll st we're still stuck in the Cold War mindset. And we've lost our edge. And now we have a group of people who want to stay back there and we have a group of people who want to move forward and that's what's happening. So what's happening is not necessarily that America is failing. It's America that's changing. And it's America that's actually growing up. This, if you look at us as most civilizations that we deal with, America right now is just a teenager, a young teenager. And we have to grow up. To give you an idea. All right. All right, we're already talking about that. We're already talking about that. Look at this population. Total population of number of representatives and everything. Uh, since we started out, our population was below 100 million. 
And now, now this chart came out way before, <laughs> way before uh, 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 we got to uh, 300 million here, but laws have been passed to cap our Congress at uh, basically uh, 435 members of the House of Representatives and 100 members uh, of Senate. So the people who are represented here, but we have an increased population. And now the official number is we're over 326 million people. And with that many people, and especially that many people made of minorities and, uh, and immigrants and young people, America has to change. That's what's going on. All right, life expectancy is longer. Now, I worked in insurance for a while as well. And one of the numbers that we saw, and this was back in 2015, that until this year happened, they were expecting to increase the life expectancy of the average woman up to 92. And the average man, yeah, and the average man up to 87. But because of two major things, COVID and the opioid crisis, the average age of Americans actually went down. Because in the majority, in the majority of Americans, which is mostly European Americans, COVID and opioids and suicide has wiped them out massively. And because of this, aging is a factor and it is gonna put more demands on government, but the larger number of people that are around here are younger. Religious beliefs, like I said, less people are considering themselves a Christian and more people are picking non-denominational. All right, family size, went through that. Reformed, and that's it. So those are the highlights, guys, of this. Any questions? Nope, I think you covered it all. Any confusions or anything you'd like for me to clear up? Um, oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. So I noticed, like, okay, like when I was reading and how you had just mentioned, like about the uh, representatives and it's supposed to be like a certain number per the people and stuff. Like, yeah. so how do you see them like resolving that? Uh, <clears throat> Congress is going to have to get off their ass and expand the number of representatives. Mm -hmm. Or if trends stay the same since... Um, our population is not necessarily growing, but the majority population is shrinking. We're probably going to just keep it at that cap of 435 for members of the U.S. representatives and 100 for uh, Senate. So that's 535 members of Congress. So, so they're not going to they're not going to change that. Go ahead, Mr. Williams. What do you want us to look out? What are the main ideas you want us to take from this chapter? I will read the textbook and I'll go over that. But what do you want us to take from this PowerPoint and this presentation that you've made? That's why I don't necessarily like chapter one because it encompasses, it's, it's basic, it truly is an introduction of everything that we're about to cover. The, I guess the one thing I want you to take away from this is that America is changing. Everything changes. And America has always been a changing system, no matter what. So take that away from it. <clears throat> and the one test question that will be about this will be about change. And, and I can tell you the test question will be a multiple choice test question too. So it's gonna be easy. 
I got another uh, little question. Like, it kind of like brought to my mind or whatever after reading. So like looking at like our population, like mm -hmm. just in America itself, like what it came from and where it's at now, like, do you see it like continuing to like grow like in the next 50 years? Like, I will tell you this. Um... Cause I have a paper that I'm, um, I'm about to research and start right now about mass incarceration, you know, with criminal mm -hmm. justice um, in my minor major. But um, yeah, I'm like, cause that's what I'm just, I'm seeing it growing and it's just like, that's why I don't see like mass incarceration ending. Cause it's like, hey, what else can we do? You know, we can't cut down more trees to make more space for people. And exactly. it's kinda... um, I will tell you mass incarceration especially that is that was influenced and still is influenced by the 1996 crime bill and um, look at Joe Biden for that but everybody likes to blame him for that but he's not to blame it was a lot more involved and people were also to blame for that but to go to your question is about uh, population is going to continue to rise and is mask incarceration is going to occur uh no because for this reason, money. And you're beginning to see that right now. If anybody has paid attention in the state of Oklahoma, um, one of the things you're seeing is criminal justice reform. Now, a lot of people have, have taken it from the point of view of a religious point of view that we should show Christian mercy in order to get better. But one of the things that I would have to say for one of the Republican representatives here in the state legislator, he said um, that massively incarcerating people doesn't do anything good. It doesn't do anything good to give somebody a long sentence. What has happened anyway, it has uh, leached the amount of resources from the state to house people which should be out on the street making a living. We have people right now in prison who's in prison for 10, 15 years for just having a little bit of marijuana and marijuana is legal now medicinally in Oklahoma. That makes no sense. And that attitude has to change and it's beginning to change. So for the sake of money, Ms. Brinkley, mass incarceration will go down because the state can no longer afford it. Also, there's another thing is happening. Now, you're seeing this out there and you're hearing this on the news that employers are looking for people to work, right? And a lot of people are blaming that they're afraid of COVID or uh, people are sitting at home because of the unemployment insurance. Let me give you this. Uh, people were having a problem finding people to work six months to a year before COVID. And the reason is, is because our immigration program, our immigration policy, especially under Trump, slowed down the number of immigrants that were coming into this country. And a lot of jobs that you guys and me don't work, immigrants were usually working those jobs now they can't find people to take those jobs. So because there's no population to take it. There's no new group of people to take it. So I would say the population will go down. Our populations as Black, Hispanics, whatever, will go up, but it still won't equal the amount uh, of the majority that's here now. So we still would be under the number. Uh, in order to get people to work and make our economy go, we have to uh, give shorter sentence to nonviolent felons out there and allow them to get into the workplace so we can make this economy go. And that's why mass incarceration will not continue. It can't, it can't afford it. I agree. Any other questions, guys? Mr. Williams, you have some question there. I see it in your eyes, sir. I'm gonna think about it. I'm gonna write them down for next class period for next Wednesday and I'll come back. 
I'll, I'll consult with you over your office hours. Okay, please do. Please do. Mr. Williams, any questions? No, sir. All right. Guys, that's it. Usually this class is scheduled for 110 to uh, 345, but like I said, uh, unless we're discussing this stuff, we're not even going to come close to that. So um, uh, it's, it's no problem with that. But if you have any questions, email me or send me something. If you have any problems with Canvas, please let me know. But other than that, uh, I will see you next Wednesday at the same time. May God bless you. Do well and think critically. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you guys.